I've entitled the message today, In God We Trust. In God We Trust. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Trust in him at how many times? All times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. I read several translations just to see the uh, wording and, and the message Bible my wife brought to my attention. You need to read it from the message Bible. So here it is. So trust him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for him. God is a safe place to be. So trust him absolutely, people. Lay your lives on the line for him. God is a safe place to be. In this verse, I believe, is a wealth of information on prayer. And I believe that the challenge in this verse is so powerful that we could live or could change, I should say, live and change our lives from this day forward just to grasp this one verse. And I did the outline, as you see, very different than anything you've ever seen me do before. Because I did the outline and for what I call an exercise to learn how to break down a scripture verse. What's in front of you is the type of style that I use when studying scripture. I may not format it like an outline for you. I'll use a different method, but I break it down like you're seeing today, is how I break down a scripture verse so that I can look up keywords and get the right understanding and definition so I get the right application of how that verse, first of all, is interpreted and then how might I apply that verse in my life. Now, we're going to be calling this verse what we call a text. It's one text. It's one verse. A text can be two or three verses you're studying at one time. I chose today to make it simple and just extract this one verse out of the entire Bible and break down just this one verse on prayer and see what it has to say. What might be called a context would be what are the verses saying before it? What are the verses saying after it? That's very important to understanding the verse. To better understand the verse and the context, the verses before and after, there's what's called greater context. The greater context says, well, what does the rest of the Bible have to say about this subject of prayer? So you can imagine the extent that we can take in Scripture to get a better understanding of this verse. So as we move along in the outline today, you'll see where I threw in extra Scriptures that can support what we're saying about this scripture. So I, I threw in some support scripture, but we're going to only concentrate on breaking down just this one verse because I want to also accomplish another thing for you. It isn't difficult to study your Bible. If we take our time and read it and break it down and look things up, you'll be amazed at how much is in just one verse. The wealth of knowledge in just one verse in the Bible. So we hope to challenge you. Now, you're going to kill me. I thought about that last night. I'm like this last night at my desk reviewing this, and I'm thinking, Lord, they're going to kill me when they see how much writing they're going to be doing today. They're going to think they're in a writing competition. So I decided this morning, after a good night's rest, what I'll do is I'll provide an insert in the bulletin next week of the entire outline of what we're going to say. So don't feel pressure to write it out. Now, you know, if you know shorthand, that's different. Uh, I asked my wife to take notes at a sermon one time. It was a good sermon. Years ago, I said, Honey, hey, take notes. Well, to my chagrin, I looked down during the sermon and she's drawing these wiggly lines. 
Remember this, babe? And I said, what is that? It's shorthand. I said, I don't read shorthand. It looked like some form of artwork or something, all these squiggly lines. She tried to get me to understand it. No, it's like computers. No. So if you're good at shorthand, just make sure you interpret that to your spouse, what you drew during the sermon, all right? So let's take a look at the first word, and it just hits us right between the eyes. The word was trust. Now that word trust, believe me, I could fill, this, I could fill that screen with, with defining the word trust. Uh, so I just highlighted a couple of them. The word trust here in this word, in the Hebrew, in this, in this verse, I looked it up, means to simply rely on. Confident, sure. I'll give an example. When you came in today, I didn't notice anybody, and I'm sure you didn't notice anybody shaking the pew. You didn't notice anybody, you know, hitting, the, putting pressure on the seat to see if it would hold you. None of you reached and looked underneath to see if everything was in place. You came in and you were sure. You were confident and you relied on your knowledge that if I sit in this pew, in fact, I'll take that back. You never even gave it a thought. You came in, you sat down, and we've been enjoying church. You know what? That's a temporal kind of faith. But take that temporal kind of faith that we trust things and put that into a spiritual context. That's what this means when it comes to God. Simply trust God. Trust God. And what's important here is that this word trust here, when it says trust in him, this is a choice we must make. That's the secret. We, we're being invited to make a choice that we are going to trust in God. And it, it, it really is, now let me say this without getting in trouble. Uh, as easy as it was for you to come and sit in the pew today, why can't it be as easy just to trust God? Why the list? Why the questions? Why the doubt? Why not just trust God at his word and what he says? So what are we to trust in? The Bible says in this verse, we are to trust in him. So we put our trust in him. Uh, now, listen carefully. Not in what you want, but what he wants. Not in what we want, but in what he wants. There is nothing wrong with making your request known. That's what Philippians 4, 6 is about. There's nothing wrong with making your request known. At the same time, his direction and answer. We trust in him. At the same time, we trust his answer, we trust his direction. We have no clue, folks, all that God did for us this week. Do you know that? We have no clue. We have to believe that as we moved about our week, just because we don't have a noticeable thing, a noticeable experience or a situation or crisis that came up, to think that that's the only thing that erupted this week that changed our course of thought or maybe direction of the week, whatever it may have been, we need to realize that this is much, much bigger than that. We need to realize that we have no clue all that God did for us. Here we are sitting today, enjoying the presence of the Lord, and we don't have a clue that all God protected us from and did. We don't know that, but God knows it. Because you see, God looks down and he sees everything. And this is why we're to put our trust in him, not in what we want. It's not wrong to let God know what you want and what you need. It's not wrong for us to make our petitions known. But we do that with the understanding that it's in his hands. The result is in his hands. The result is in his hands. And that's where we put our trust. Our trust is in him for what he wants, not in what we want. Again, make your request known. But trust 
rely on, be confident, be sure of the fact that the one that you talk to, the God that we serve, has absolutely everything mapped out and everything in play. We just have to come to him and make our request known. When do we do it? At when? All times. All times. Now, this is important. It's about continuous awareness that he's ever with us so that we can trust him. I can trust him because I know he's there. Because I know he's there all the time, I can trust him. I trust in him at all times. All times, are you ready? All times includes all circumstances automatically. All times automatically includes all things. So it means whatever comes up new, and this is very, very important, the circumstances, they're going to change. You and I will not have the same kind of circumstances this next week that I had this past week. Maybe a couple, but I'll guarantee there will probably be different circumstances that will occur. But the fact that the circumstances will change does not necessitate that we are to stop and assess the circumstances to see if I'm going to trust them. Did you catch that? The circumstances are going to probably change from day to day. But it does not necessitate, does not mean that we are to stop having trust in what we were believing in God before and assume or assess the new circumstances to see, well, do I need to trust him for that? No, the Bible says, trust in him at when? All times. Why? There's no room for the other because two things. We do not want to leave any room for doubt. We say, well, how would I do that? Well, what if you haven't received the answer from God yet on the circumstances from last week? What if you haven't received an answer to prayer from God from last week yet? Could that discourage you to pray for something new? Could you say to yourself, well, why am I pursuing this? I haven't got the last answer I prayed for. I'm breaking that down, making it simple to, to see the point. We do not want to leave any room for doubt because what the Bible says, just keep trusting. I don't know if anybody caught um, Steve Harvey. Hun, was that on YouTube? Someplace you found that. She said, honey, you got to come in. You got to listen to this. And Steve Harvey is closing out his show, I guess, that he does the end. Did anybody catch this? Did you know he was preaching? Did I say something wrong? Oh, you're, you're laughing. I thought I said something wrong. Oh, okay, you're just having fun. Well, keep having fun. All right. I thought I, no, no, it's okay. I just thought I said something wrong. That's cute. Uh, but if, did, if, did anybody catch Steve Harvey? Oh, I know why you're laughing because it's Steve Harvey. That's right. He makes everybody laugh. Um, he was preaching a sermon on knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The message he left the people was a message about knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Correct me? That's what his message was. He actually preached a sermon and then walked off the stage. I, I told my wife that he needs to work on his family feud jokes sometimes. <laughs> but in the meantime, he presented the gospel of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior when he walked off the show. I thought that was really powerful. But he said something about prayer. He says, prayer is... When you pray, God automatically hears and God automatically packages it up and he sends it back to you in a box. Of course, me being the analytical, theological thinker said right off the bat, she'll know, right off the bat, I said, ah, I'm having a little problem with that statement. And then he said this, he said, the only thing is when God sends that box back to you with the answer, he doesn't necessarily give you a date when to open it. Ah, very good, Steve. Now you got it. Okay, we're all right, man. We're good. Because this is how I thought over the years. I just worded differently than that. I believe that God collects every one of your prayers. I think he collects our prayers. I think he groups them up. I think they're in his hands. And God, at his timetable, in his sovereignty, in his will, in his power, will deliver that answer as he deems best, when he deems it's best, how he wants to do it. But I believe the answer will be on the way. So we are to pray, by the way, O oh people, O oh people. Pray, trust at all times, O oh people. 
Some translations say all people. Some translations say you people. All right. All people as one concert of prayer. That's what he was teaching. The fact that he said people made it plural. He meant something collectively. Now on the screen. Uh, oh, they corrected it. Oh, you guys are great. Uh, I was wrong in my outline. It's, it was Second Chronicles 21 through 4, not 104. So they've corrected that. Thank you. If, if, if you look at many places in the Old Testament, you will see, and you'll find this in the New Testament, you will see that the whole family got together in prayer. Ezra, Nehemiah, Deuteronomy. You'll see here in Chronicles that when King Jehoshaphat was standing before God asking what should we do with three hostile armies coming against us? The Bible makes it clear that the whole family was standing before God. Listen, there's nothing more powerful than a church full of people praying. There's nothing more powerful than a whole church full of people praying. You know what we experience on praise night? You know what we experience today in praise? Look at the interaction. Look at the, look at the togetherness. Well, that's what happens when we pray together. Same thing. You sense the presence of God. You sense that power of God. But then there's something else. Not only is there nothing more powerful than a church full of people praying, there's nothing as powerful either as a family praying together in the home. Oh, and by the way, there's something else that's just as powerful as a family praying together in the home or a church praying together on Sunday. It's the individual who learns how to pray and get in the presence of God, be it married or not married. Now, when you get an individual person that decides to get a hold of God in prayer, it's going to affect the person they're married to and or their friends and or somebody else in their lives. Oh, and by the way, when you get the marriage and you get the family and you get the friends together praying and you come together as a church, you've got a whole church praying. Oh, by the way, when you get a whole church praying together in concert, unity, things will happen. Things will happen, church. Things will happen for the glory of God. That's why the teaching was trust in God at all times, you people. Ah, let's take a look at what I am calling the missing art. He goes on to say, pour out your hearts, pour out your hearts. The word poor, or the word hearts here has to do, basically speaking, the total person inside. The absolute, total, full person. The inner being. In fact, I believe if you want, we can make it the body, the soul, the spirit. The entire being is pouring their hearts out to God. The word poor here means intensively sprawl, to sprawl out before God, to spill forth now, this is not pouring your hearts out to God. Jesus helps us have a good day. I love you. Amen. See you later. <laughs> this is not pouring your hearts out to God. Jesus, thank you for a good day. I love you. Good night. That's not pouring our hearts out to God. The ideal to pour out here, and if you study this word more, you'll see it has to do with an earnest intensity, a passionate thorough, gut-wrenching, desperate cry out to God. Now, let me explain something. When somebody is weeping, we assume they're really pouring their hearts out to God. But there's a possibility that you could be crying out before God and then not be tears. I have done it both ways. There have been times I've been crying profusely. My shirt's getting wet from tears. And there are times when I wasn't shedding a tear, but the intense, earnest desire and craving and, and thrust I was throwing out on God was just as powerful as were the tears that were coming down at other times. So it's not necessarily that the word cry has to mean tears, but it does have that idea behind it of pour, spilling forth, spilling it out there's a possibility that's becoming a missing art in the body of Christ today. And the reason, one reason, is because we're taught to just have faith, to have trust and faith. And if we're taught just to have faith and trust, which this verse says, trust in God, 
We can't think for a moment that all I have to do is just, okay, Lord, you know what I want today. See you later. You're all knowing. You know it all. I ain't got time to talk to you about this, but you know it because you know my heart. I move on. No. And there are people who do believe that all you have to do is, Lord, I have faith in what you want to do today. You know my desires. I'll check in later and see what the results are. There are people who really do believe that. They do. We've met people like that. And I don't see that all by itself in Scripture. I see where we should have faith in God. When you get up tomorrow morning or whenever you pray and you are trusting God for something, you, you, you do move on. We do have to get up and go to work. Or we do have to go well, tomorrow. You might cook out instead. But you, because it's a holiday. But you do pick up and you keep on going with life because life has to keep on going, don't you? That's just normal. But that doesn't mean that deep within my heart there isn't that yearning and that craving and that awareness that I still need to be trusting God. And it's good to have faith that what you pray for that God will do. That God will do. That God will do. What I ask for? Yeah, it's okay to trust God for that. But what God wants, because God is looking down and he sees the entire picture. To spill forth. Ask yourself a question. I'll do the same. When's the last time we have simply cried out to God? And folks, we're living in a time, <clears throat> we are living in a time where we do need to do some pretty heavy duty crying out to God. Folks, we're living in a time that we better be doing some pretty heavy duty sprawling out, <laughs> spilling forth our heart before God. Y'all listening to the news or not? What's going on in the Middle East right now? All right. What's that scripture going to say? To trust at all times. Pour your hearts out to who? To my neighbor. To my wife. To my counselor. To my friend. Is that what it says? To him. To him. Now. Why to him? Because he's the supreme being. Do you know why we're here today? Because God created us. Now watch this. There was nothing in the beginning. But God created the heavens and the earth. I was out with Doogie last night. Beautiful evening. Just looked in the sky and said, wow. Oh, it's magnificent. Every once in a while, I see the falling stars, and I think, wow, Lord, what an operation you got going here. I didn't say that one last night, but I've said that before. You think different things each time. But I've thought to myself, Lord, what, what operation you have going on in this universe? And to think there was a day it was zero. <laughs> he even created sneeze so we could release the pressure in our sinuses. Isn't that so cool? <laughs> God as supreme being folks he's supreme being listen this is not saying that we cannot open up to God only open up to God and not to a friend or a counselor or a family but it is saying that we can't open up so much to a, a friend a counselor or someone or a family member or a loved one and not open up to God there has to first be, the verse here is very clear. That's why I love looking at just this one verse. Because if the Bible was only one verse, <laughs> from cover to cover, this is a good verse to live life by. Because you're talking about coming to the one who created everything. The one who knows everything. The one who has all power. The one who's all strength. The one who's all knowing. Who else in the world could we trust that to? Stuff to? Like God. Who else? Who else could we do that to? If you, and here's the thing I get concerned about, is that if we only talk to people and we don't talk to God, do you know it takes a lot of energy? We expend a lot of energy talking to friends, a lot of energy talking to counselors, a lot of energy talking to a family member. We spend a lot of energy. We expose, we take, we, we, we express a lot of our emotion, a lot of our feeling to that. And you know what? After a while, you've done so much of that, you don't have the energy to, to cry out to God. 
See, I think our first, our first mode of operation should be to expend that energy and expend that attention and express those words to first God, who knows all things, who has the answer. And we should not use people for the answer. We should use the people for the confirmation. So let a friend I talk to be a confirmation. But let me first find the answer from God. Let, let, let me let God be the one that shows me. And, and he does it in two ways. He can speak to me spiritually, but he's given me his word. I can go to the word and get the answer. So let me use you to confirm, but let me use God to get the answer. I don't want to look to mankind to get the answer. I want to look to God for the answer. And I want to use mankind to confirm, to encourage, to help along, check in, keep us accountable. But ladies and gentlemen, God is the answer. His word is the answer. It's his answer. It's his answer to us. So it's good to open up to friends, but it's better to spend time opening up to God. I, I've received many answers to prayer over the years that I never had even mentioned to my wife, nonetheless anyone else, because I spent time to get it from God. And when I heard from God, I moved on. I might testify about it later, others might hear about it later, but I didn't get it from a human. I got it from God. I got it from his word. He took nothing and made all this so he can take my life, your life, and make something out of it. Amen. To God, for God is our what? For God is our refuge. That means that he's a boulder, he's a rock. Look it up, check me out. And everything I've said today, a boulder, a rock, he's our salvation, he's our strength, he's our foundation. That's what this phrase means. He's a spiritual place. I love this. And, and, and Psalms 46 supports all of this. A spiritual place. He is a spiritual place. He is a spiritual place. It's being in his hands. Now, there's two things that are being said here. One, it, literally, and secondly, metaphorically. God doesn't have hands. But metaphorically, he does. He does not have a literal body form. He's a spirit. But to describe God, you'll see metaphorical phrases. His arm's not too heavy. They can't lift you up. His hands are, you know, the Bible talks about that. The... This refuge can be also a literal place. You know that today we're like in a shelter here. Shelter can be a spiritual application, but it, there can be a physical shelter. There can be a physical refuge. You know, I lift up my eyes into the hills. The, that was an actual refuge place when people were traveling. That literally meant that there would be tabernacles all over the countryside where when they were traveling, they could stop and have refuge, have nourishment, physically, spiritually, be taught scripture, then back on the road they would do their travels. That's where the, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from where comes my help. That's where that comes from. Psalm 121. So it can be a lit physical thing, a literal thing, but it's also metaphorical. The whole point is, it depends on the context of the scripture you're reading. And in this context, God is our rock. He's our boulder. He's our salvation. He's our strength. He's our foundation. He is a spiritual place. We are in the hands of of God. I don't know any other best place to be today than in God's hands. I want to close with a, another verse that's interesting. We, we broke this verse down, but I want to close with this verse, Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God, I love that, eternal God, always been, is, always will be, never any beginning, never any ending, is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms, metaphorical, Underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemies before you, saying, destroy them. He will drive out your enemies before you. Honey, when you leave here today, the enemy will be on the run. The only way it won't be on the run is if you invite him into your sphere of activity. Unless you invite him into the sphere, the sphere, the sphere of your thoughts, your conversation, our taste buds. That's the only way the enemy can reappear. But as far as God's concerned, he's on the run. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. If God be for you, who can be against you? 
And because I've overcome the world, you can overcome the world. God is good. Trust in the Lord at all times. Oh, people, put your trust in him at all times because he's the answer. Praise the Lord. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's trust God when we leave today.